So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren and I'm your host of Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find the work that I do on the links that I have over on my Instagram account under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. I'd like to start with a segment from a book called The Enchanted Hour by Megan Cox Gurdon. In 2015, a British political philosopher named Adam Swift infuriated parents across the English-speaking world by suggesting that people who read aloud to their children ought to reflect on the way they are, quote, unfairly disadvantaging, unquote, other people's children. It was a puckish way of framing an uncomfortable truth, and the internet being what it is, irate correspondents deluge the University of Warwick professor with hate mail. Most of Swift's critics didn't take the trouble to read his original interview with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, so they missed his most extraordinary assertion. Evidence shows, Swift has said, that the difference between children who get bedtime stories and those who don't, the difference in their life chances, is bigger than the difference between those who get elite private schooling and those who don't. Swift was using the phrase bedtime stories the way others use goodnight moon time as academic shorthand for myriad informal behaviors that include reading aloud, such as the talk at the table, the family culture, the parenting styles, the inculcation of attitudes and values, as he put it. Harvard political scientist Robert Putman makes a similar case calling goodnight moon time one of the most significant indicators of a child's academic prospects. In his book, Our Kids, Putnam cites the work of Jane Waldfogel and Elizabeth Washbrook when he writes that differences in parenting, especially maternal sensitivity and nurturing, but also provision of books, library visits, and the like, is the single most important factor explaining differences in school readiness between rich kids and poor kids, as measured by literacy, mathematics, and language test scores at age four. Human development is cumulative. Each experience and each skill a person acquires informs the next. When it comes to reading aloud in childhood, the repercussions don't stop when kids get to school or even when they reach adolescence. The ripples spread outward and onward into adulthood. This is true in a positive way when children are read to, and it's true and it's true in a lamentable way, one in a lamentable one when they go without. A 2012 study found that children who enter kindergarten having had no little or no good night moon time tend to lag other children by 12 to 14 months in their language and pre-reading skills. Once at school, these children are just as likely as their peers to relish the fun and stimulation of story time with the rhymes and humor and adventures and illustrations and all the rest of it. Yet in their innocence, they stand separated by the unforgiving math of a phenomenon called the word gap. A landmark study in the early 1990s uncovered stark differences in the number of words that children hear or do not hear, depending on how they're raised. A gap of 30 million words by age three. A 2017 study put the number at 
four million words by age four. Less of a gap, perhaps, but a chasm, nonetheless. The implications matter, not just for individual children, but for our wider society. Because early language and the cognitive and social skills associated with it are so closely linked with academic success. Recent inquiry has laid bare what might seem a counterintuitive link between the skills that children need to do well in English and the skills they need to do well in math. These two classroom subjects might seem on the surface to have little in, in common, but they have critical hidden points of connection. When children struggle with math in middle school and early high school years, it turns out that the difficulty often lies less with numbers and numeracy than with words and reading. According to Dr. Cadis Kendall, president and co-founder of Read Aloud, 15 minutes, a national campaign to persuade parents to read daily to their children, if you can't do fifth grade reading problems, which are the first really analytical math problems that you encounter, if you can't process complex sentences, it is very hard to press even into equation math and formula math because you've missed this whole analytical process in the fifth grade. So when you think of how many kids aren't proficient or reading ready in the fourth grade, it means that as a country we have immediately lost almost half of our potential science, technology, engineering, and mathematics workforce. It's frightening. As CEO of a clinical research organization, Kendall experienced firsthand the difficulty in finding qualified young graduates to conduct lab work. It's like 45% of kids are not proficient, she said. They may be able to read, but they're not proficient enough to do sophisticated analytical reading. The numbers may be worse than Kendall thinks. A 2015 report found that 64% of U.S. fourth graders didn't meet the standards for proficient reading. If a fourth grader can't read well today, it means he, won't, he wasn't up to snuff last year either, nor probably the year before when he was in second grade. The line of data and reasoning snakes backward through the elementary school grades, back through kindergarten and nursery school, back to a child's earliest years. That process that precious early time is the starting place for academic deficits that may not become an obvious problem until high school. Something like 20%, a fifth of American teenagers leave high school functionally illiterate, meaning that they do not read or write well enough to navigate the working world. It is an awful way to start adult life. 85% of kids who get into trouble with the law have poor literacy skills. 70% of prisoners in state and federal institutions are in the same predicament, as are 43% of people living in poverty. It's grim stuff. In this context, reading aloud to children becomes much more than a source of emotional and intellectual nourishment, though it is, more even than a developmental issue. Imagine how the world would look if every child had stories read aloud every night. As the picture book creator and read aloud advocate Rosemary Wells says, we could narrow the achievement gap without spending another dime. From Kim Rosin's book, Saved by a Poem. At times it is not, it's, it is not for comfort or support or even affirmation that I'm drawn to a poem. Instead, it is for a stretch. A poem can summon me to an edge that scares me, but one I know I need to face. Sometimes it is the tone of the poem that stretches me beyond my comfort zone. The brashness of D.H. Lawrence's wild imagination, for instance. Would you like to throw a stone at me? Here, take all that's left of my peach or Anna Swirr's unabashed wonder and sexuality. I make love with my dear as if I were dying. Or the poem might ask me to open myself to the pain of those suffering unbearable circumstances, 
as do Anna Akhmaltova's epilogue about the Stalinist terror in Leningrad. There I learned how faces fall apart and the memory of her face by, Aunt, by Eve Ensler. When she woke up, her face was on fire about a woman in the midst of the Iraq war. Each of these poems calls me into communion with people around the world and across time. I am invited into the inner life of someone I took to be a stranger and am shocked to find myself utterly connected. Either I am gratefully, I can gratefully bow to the welcome disorientation and move on to the next page in the book or the next moment of my day, or I can choose to take this poem deeper into my life. When you decide to develop an ongoing relationship with such a poem, to read it deeply and frequently, to discover its layers of meaning and music, to allow it to guide you and teach you, perhaps even to learn it by heart, you are consciously inviting that poem to stretch you beyond yourself. I think of this as the yoga of poetry. While the word yoga has become associated with certain physical practices usually designed to strengthen and open the body, the original Sanskrit word has a much vaster meaning. B.K.S. Inyangar defines it in this way. The word yoga is derived from the Sanskrit root meaning to bind, join, attach, and yoke, to direct and concentrate one's attention on, to use and apply. It also means union or communion. It is the true union of our will with the will of God. This yoking of your personal will to something greater can take you beyond your normal edges, whether by way of a yoga asana a physical pose that stretches and strengthens your body, or by way of contemplative practices that stretch and strengthen your powers of attention and insight. When I take a good yoga class, the teacher will guide me into physical positions that are sometimes extremely difficult to hold. Yet if I can surrender into and through the discomfort, eventually a vibrancy will come into the stretch and I will find myself at home far beyond the boundary of what I thought was possible for my body to do. To me, this ease and the mental opening that invariably comes with it are intriguing. It seems that shaping my will and body to oppose that yogis have practiced for centuries sometimes opens a door between the world so that a flood of consciousness passed down through the ages pours into my cells. This can happen with a poem. If you consciously choose one that you know will take you beyond your comfort zone, the yoga of joining your consciousness to the consciousness inherent in the words can stretch you from the inside out. A poem is a physical event. It enters your body as well as your mind. It affects your lungs, your pulse, and the tones and textures of your voice. Here's some thoughts from the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Resistance is infallible. Like a magnetized needle floating on the surface of oil, resistance will unfailingly point to true north, meaning that calling or action it most wants to stop us from doing. We can use this. We can use this as a compass. We can navigate by resistance, letting it guide us to that calling or action that we must follow before all others. Rule of thumb. The more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel. We will feel toward pursuing it. Resistance is universal. We're wrong if we think we're the only ones struggling with resistance. Everyone who has a body experiences resistance. Resistance never sleeps. 
Henry Fonda was still throwing up before each stage performance, even when he was 75. In other words, fear doesn't go away. The warrior and the artist live by the same code of necessity, which dictates that the battle must be fought anew every day. Resistance plays for keeps. Resistance's goal is not to wound or disable. Resistance aims to kill. Its target is the epicenter of our being, our genius, our soul, the unique and priceless gift we were put on earth to give, and that no one else has but us. Resistance means business. When we fight it, we're in a war to the death. Resistance is fueled by fear. Resistance has no strength of its own. Every ounce of juice it possesses comes from us. We feed it with power by our fear of it. Master that fear and we conquer resistance. Resistance only opposes in one direction. Resistance obstructs movement only from a lower sphere to a higher sphere. It kicks in when we seek to pursue a calling in the arts, launch an innovative enterprise, or evolve to a higher station morally, ethically, and spiritually. So if you're in Calcutta working with the Mother Teresa Foundation, and you're thinking of bolting to launch a career in telemarketing, relax. Resistance will give you a free pass. Resistance is most powerful at the finish line. Odysseus almost got home years before his actual homecoming. Ithaca was in sight, close enough that the sailors could see the smoke of their family's fires on shore. Odysseus was so certain he was safe, he actually lay down for a snooze. It was then that his men, believing there was gold in an oxhide sack among their commander's possessions, snatched his prize, this prize and cut it open. The bag contained the adverse winds, which King Aeolus had bottled up for Odysseus when the wanderer had touched, had touched earlier as his blessed isle. The winds burst forth now in one mad blow, driving Odysseus' ships back across every league of ocean they had with such difficulty traversed, making him endure further trials and sufferings before. At last and alone, he reached home for good. The danger is greatest when the finish line is in sight. At this point, resistance knows we're about to beat it. It hits the panic button. It marshals one last assault and slams us with everything it's got. The professional must be alert for this counterattack. Be wary at the end. Don't open that bag of wind.